Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hibbert. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television Program. We are here and we're going through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It is a good journey. Glad you decided to join us today. Here to tell us what she's doing is Corey. Corey, what's up? Today, we are going to be taking a look at ancient documents and how the ancients wrote and kept their records. Excellent. Very good. Look forward to that, Corey. And you studied today. What did yes, you do? Yes, I did. We're going to talk a little bit about Jezebel's plan. All right. Very good. We're going to learn about Jezebel. All right. Very good. Ryan's up. Ryan, what are you doing? Today, I'm responding to a commonly asked but very important Bible question, and that is this. How could King David, a man of many sins, be regarded in the Bible as a man after God's own heart? Really? A man after God's own heart? This is a lot of interesting things happening on today's mm -hmm. program. And later on when we teach, we're going to be talking about Ahab's sin. King Ahab is the king, and there's a problem in Israel. Today, you and I are going to explore how history has been passed down to us today. So specifically in the very ancient world, in the BC world or BCE common world, how, how did uh, ancient people record and write history? Uh, and you might be surprised at just how many different methods there were. Take a look. Ancient written documents come in a surprising variety of shapes, sizes, and materials. This diversity is partially due to the convenience of finding writing materials and partially due to organizational and symbolic reasoning. While most modes of writing in the ancient world seem very permanent to us today, there were also wax tablets, the ancient answer to a notebook. These tablets were generally made of wood and then covered in a layer of wax. The writer could inscribe their notes into the surface of the wax, and then when no longer needed, the wax could be heated and smoothed and used again. A very popular permanent writing material in the ancient Middle East was clay, likely due to its availability and the ease of writing. Clay also provided the ancient writer with the option to change the shape of the entire document. Documents have been found ranging from a couple inches across to a few feet across. There have also been clay documents discovered made into different shapes. Within record rooms, it has been noted that some shapes were very practical, serving for instant identification of the type of document. For example, different types of contracts would often be recorded on a specific shape of tablet so that the record keeper could instantly identify, say, a grain contract when he walked into the room. There are other shaped documents whose purpose seems more symbolic than practical, cylinders, prisms, and cones. These documents normally preserve text that is monumental, ceremonial, or religious in nature, and they are often found in palaces or buildings commissioned by the king, buried into the foundations as symbolic cornerstones or into walls as symbolic nails. These could not have been meant for anyone to read, but God or the gods, and also to preserve memory of the king for future generations when repairs would need to be made to these structures. In this way, a king could attempt to make his name famous in heaven and the future. Now you may be wondering why did I choose this point in the Bible to begin talking about how history was recorded and how uh, ancient men and women recorded documents. And the reasoning behind this is we're at the time period here of Ahab and Jezebel. And right in this time period, there are so, so many different documents and, and artifacts that have been found beginning in this time period and forward in the time period of the Kings. A lot of it has to do with Israel and Judah's interaction at this point with uh, many of the other surrounding nations around Israel and Judah. So a lot of it had to do with war uh, and, and as um, an outcome of war would be different kings and queens commissioning uh, different um, monument stones or memorial stones that recorded the battle. Uh, also just uh, recording for their personal records and record keeping different battles or even different systems 
terms of trade. It wasn't all uh, um, very negative. It didn't all have to do with warfare. A lot of it also had to do with uh, trade and economics. So recording uh, much of those. And uh, even from this time period, uh, we have found as well, archaeologists have found a seal that has the name Jezebel on it. And it seems to be a royal seal uh, from this very time period. So it's very, it's a very popular belief among the scholarly community that this is in fact Queen Jezebel's personal seal. You know, when we desire something, we compare ourselves with others based on our accomplishments and so on, rather than ascertaining our need. Now, in other words, we manipulate things that rule our soul. God's word addresses the soul and God's laws are not to fulfill our wants, but to address our needs. Of course, we feel that we can do better if we get what we want versus what we need. Now, King Ahab wanted land belonging to somebody else. Naboth, the owner, told the king that the Lord forbade the Israelites to give away any inheritance from their fathers. That's true. Ahab was disappointed and depressed. So Queen Jezebel, who is full of Satan, unjustly framed Naboth and had him murdered for his vineyard. First Kings 21 verses 1 through 14. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near next to my house and for it I will give you a vineyard better than it or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise. Eat food and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. So the men of his city, the elders and nobles who were the inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent to them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with high honor among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones, so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. 
1 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. It is amazing to read the Word of God as we begin to study and begin to learn all about the history of ancient Israel. That's what Kings is all about. And Kings and Chronicles, they parallel, but Chronicles speaks more about the priestly setup, if you would. And so that's interesting. But Kings is more about what happened at this time. And as we begin to study and continue to study, we learn much from the history. Now, if you have your Bible guide, get it out in your Bible. But if you don't have your Bible guide, you can write for a Bible guide. Write to us using the Canadian address or the United States address or the address in England. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com and get it there. Click on Donate Here and make a donation of any amount, and it'll take you to the pages, the PDF pages for the Bible guide. And I really want you to get it. It is really good. You can only get it through us. But in our steps of faith, or our works of faith today, the only question that I really have is, what was King Ahab's sin? Because this is King Ahab's sin. This is very interesting because he actually didn't do the sin. Jezebel did the sin, but still he's responsible. As we read 1 Kings chapter 20 to 22, we catch up with going through the Bible. And as we do that, we're going to look at 1 Kings 21 verses 1 to 14. A lot of reading today. So let's look at this passage and see what God is saying to us. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to hear your word and proclaim and listen to it and proclaim what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Kings 21, 1 to 3. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel. And next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth and he said, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near. It is next to my house and for it I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But you know, Nahab said to Ahab, listen, the Lord forbid, or Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Now that is fascinating. When he didn't get it, the vineyard he wanted, per God's law, Naboth could not give it to anyone. We must not follow manipulation. Listen carefully. King Ahab was so depressed when he didn't give or didn't get the vineyard he wanted for God's law, because of God's law, Naboth could not give it to anyone. We must not manipulate God's law or any law. We must not manipulate it, beloved. We must understand what God is saying here. He's saying you can do a lot of things in business, but when it comes to my law, you can't change it. Very important. And beloved, there are many times that we try to change things in our life and we really shouldn't. We should just honor what God has given us and believe that and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's interesting. 1 Kings chapter 21, 4 to 7 says, So Ahab went into his house, sullen and displeased, because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father's, And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came into him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke with Naboth at the Jezreelite. And he said to me, You know, give me, I said to him, Give me your vineyard for money or else. If it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, you now exercise authority over Israel, don't you? Arise, eat food, let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Okay, this is fascinating. Listen carefully. Ahab was depressed, so Jezebel fixed it for him. We must never fix something when it is not ours to fix. God tells us what we need. When God speaks to someone, 
He speaks to them as the divine mind. Now, we can interfere, but we need not interfere, beloved. We must pay attention to what God is doing. And so we need to understand that the Lord is working on our friends and on us and on people, and we need to recognize how God is working. Keep that in mind. Now watch this. This is very important. Second, or 1 Kings 21, 8 through 14. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. Now she wrote in the letters saying, proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him saying, you have blasphemed God the king, God and the king, and then take him out and stone him that he may die. So the men of the city, the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants of the city, they did as Jabel had sent them, had said to them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with high honor among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him and against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God, the king, God and the king. And they took him outside the city, and they stoned him with stones, so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel and said, Naboth has been stoned. This is how the king Ahab got his property. Now we learn that Jezebel framed Naboth. She framed him and he was murdered, beloved. This was injustice done in the name of God. We must never, ever cause injustice for ourselves or anyone else. As we begin to come in on this, we need to understand that God is working and God is doing things with individuals. We believe in a personal God who's personally involved, personally in your personal life. And so if you believe that, then you need to recognize that when you talk to your friends, you talk to your boss, you talk to your employees, you talk to the people who work with you, we need to understand that God is working in their life. And as we understand that, we need to know we need not get in the way because God is saying something. But at the same time, God may be using us. And so we need to be involved, but only under his authority. This is so important, beloved, as we look at this. So here it is, and Jezebel did wrong. We must never do wrong before the Lord. Next time on Quick Study Television, when we continue going through the Bible and learning, we're going to be talking about the prophet who's taken away. And this is very interesting for Elisha because Elisha is gone. He's left the planet. What happened? We'll talk about it next time on Quick Study Television. Ryan, what's up? Well, today I respond to a Bible question asked by many critics and Christians alike. And here it is. How could King David, a man of many sins, be regarded in the Bible as a man after God's own heart? and one whose heart was perfect before him. Let's take a closer look at the relevant passages. Due to its offensive nature, many attempts have been made to discredit the Bible as the word of God. 
For example, critics ask how King David, a man of many sins, could be regarded in the Bible as a man after God's own heart, and one whose heart was perfect before him. In both 1 Kings 11.4 and 15.3, we read that David's heart was considered to be perfect before the Lord. And according to 1 Samuel 13.14 and Acts 13.22, God also considered David to be a man after his very own heart. It is very true that even before David became king of Israel, he had committed several sins and offenses to his discredit, such as his deception of the high priest Ahimelech, which resulted in the massacre of nearly every priest in the city of Nob by the agents of King Saul. Most famously, David is known for his affair with Bathsheba and the subsequent murder of her husband Uriah. How then could David, a man of such iniquity, be credited with a perfect heart? First important to note is the Hebrew word used in 1 Kings 11.4 and 15.3. It is shalem, which has been translated as perfect in the King James Bible, but can also be rendered as wholly devoted or fully devoted, since the word's basic meaning is complete, whole, sound, finished, or even at peace with someone. Also, the scriptures reveal that one is not required to be completely sinless in order to be one after God's own heart. If this was so, then no one could be considered as such, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. One of the main reasons David was considered a man after God's own heart was because his central purpose was to glorify God and not himself. The glory of God, the will of God, and the loving fellowship of God were what mattered most to him. David knew how to trust God's grace and forgiving love enough to confess and forsake his iniquity in an attitude of true repentance. We see here that for us to be one after God's own heart does not require us to be sinless, since this would obviously be impossible. It's true, the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what is required of us to be considered one after God's own heart? Well, David was the biblical example. As I mentioned, it was his attitude towards God. David wanted to glorify God first. David also admitted when he was wrong and didn't make excuses. He accepted the punishment. In fact, Old Testament scholar Gleason Archer, in considering the incident with Bathsheba and Uriah, observed how Psalm 32 reveals what unbearable agony he went through after the affair with Bathsheba, until finally the prophet Nathan came to him and condemned his crimes in the name of Yahweh. A lesser man would have flared up against this daring prophet and had him put to death. But one of the greatest assets in David's character was his ability to receive rebuke, to acknowledge his utter sinfulness, and to cast himself on the mercy of God to forgive him, cleanse him, and restore him to holy fellowship once more. Here we have an example, not of an error or contradiction, but of the amazing mercy of God and how we too can be people after God's own heart. You know, that's true, Ryan. And, and as I, I'm thinking about this and talking about this, uh, there is a question. We'll deal with it on the next program when we have time for it. But the question is that God, does God is he the one who allowed the evil spirit to come into Saul? Because the Bible says that God sent an evil spirit and Saul was taken over by that. So right. what's going on here? You know, yeah. we'll talk about that. Okay, uh, sounds good. Next time on Quick Study Television. <laughs> anyway, yeah. what did you study today? Well, we're talking about Jezebel and King Ahab. And of course, he wanted this field that belonged to Naboth. But according to God's law, to the Israelites, they were not allowed to sell their land or give their land away if it was not in their family group. It had to remain in their family group. So as we read this story and we see that Jezebel's plan carried out, which was she had Naboth killed so that then King Ahab could have his land. What we don't see here in the scripture, but it clearly happened, was that Naboth's heirs were also killed. So not only was Naboth, mm -hmm. but we don't read about it in this passage, but if we look ahead into 2 Kings chapter 9, we see that Jehu has been anointed king, and then he has just um, shot Jehoram through the back, through his shoulders, and, and the arrow comes out his heart that we learn. And then we pick it up in verse 25. Um, Let's see here. Then Jehu said to Bidkar, his captain, pick him up and throw him into the tract of the field of Naboth. Mm. So we hear Naboth's name come up again with the field. The Jezreelite, for remember, when you and I were riding together behind Ahab, his father, that the Lord laid this burden upon him. And this is the Lord talking now. Surely I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, says the Lord. 
and I will rep repay you in this plot, says the Lord. And then it, and it goes on. Mm -hmm. So we read and we know that Naboth was killed, but it went beyond that. Yeah, and yeah. God was keeping track God, of all of this. God knew. God knew exactly what was happening. Yeah, that but, really uh, is interesting. Just wanted to add that dimension here that, that her mm. plot was actually very evil. And, uh, because she was an evil person. Yeah. She was mm -hmm. totally evil. She's consumed by Satan. Yeah. And her end was interesting, and we'll read about it coming up. We will. Mm -hmm. It is something we that will. is not, we're not happy with uh, that whole situation, but God dealt with it. Very good. But it's interesting, because as you move forward into the Bible, you will see, if you pay attention, and it, you take your time and read, you will see, oh, because you, you get to Second Kings, oh, Naboth mm -hmm. and, and the field, I, I just read about that. And mm -hmm. you can you can really yeah. blend the stories it and ties put it back, it back together. In, it, it, does. it really does make sense that she wouldn't just have been able to kill Naboth, because then his sons would have inherited that that yeah. field. Exactly. So it, it, you, it kind of, it's kind of implied in the text that if you know the law, oh, she couldn't have just stopped there. She would have had to go. But it's neat that it ties it back in for us. You're exactly. right. You yeah. can see it. Absolutely. Those of us that, that don't know yeah. the traditions yeah. and what God had in place, because if Naboth's sons would have seen Naboth react like that, they, of course, would have held fast to the same. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely true. <laughs> and uh, these, these these are some of the things that are also covered in the Bible guide. Remember to write for your Bible guide. Mm -hmm. And when you write, send an offering in any amount, because that's how we continue on here. Uh, we don't have, you know, big donation gifts behind us from somebody who has not seen. It's you. It's uh, people who are taking and saying, you know, I'm going to give a little bit here and a little That's bit right. there. That's how we've always done it. And I want to remind you that God has kept us alive. God is alive. And the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in fact, Jesus Christ, his son, came and died 2,000 years ago so that we could ask forgiveness of him and he could come into our heart as Lord of our life and give us an eternal life. That is amazing. Do you have eternal life? Because you can if you invite Jesus Christ into your heart and say, Jesus, come into my heart and be the Lord of my life today.